Paulo Chow, and Dr. Paulo Chow is an associate professor um, in our college and community in the Department of Computer Engineering and Science. Mm -hmm. Computer Science Engineering. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, and actually, Dr. Uh, Paulo Chow just came back from a few from Alaska. So yes. Slide, red eye. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for for, uh, for being here. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll give a very short tutorial. So I think one hour. You should say, oh, one hour. What to cover about visual visualization, or uh, in my case, it's actually more like visual and data analytics. Um, and. Another title I like to give, or actually the, the other two are kind of swappable, is this is often the, the one hour or close to one hour uh, lecture that I will give at the end of my class that I, I teach at Georgia Tech every semester. So I teach that visual and data analytics class, and then it kind of like a wrap up summary of the class. And I also like to call it the 11th lessons learned because my class very apply. So uh, these are also kind of the summary of the uh, things that I learned through working with tech companies. And tech companies, these, uh, you can think of it as, as uh, Facebook, Google, Intel, eBay, Semantic. So those, those are some of the companies that we work with uh, more recently. And in case you want to know uh, what I do for my professional life, so it's very easy. You just Google Polo Child. There's only one in the world, so very easy to find. And then I list everything, including papers, research, classes, and so on. And also, like, why you would want to listen to me? So I need to convince the audience. Um, so, and uh, because the the topic is also what I do, uh, my student and I do uh, for research. Uh, my research group is called the Polo Club of Data Science. So I like to name things after myself. So that's why Polo Club. Uh, and we uh, and we develop scalable, interactive, and interpretable methods. So methods and tools to help people make sense of large amount of data. Um, so in this case, it, these tools and system could be to help people understand or make sense of large amount data, or it could also be the machine learning models, or it could be like the techniques, uh, because a lot of time these days are actually they're very complex. So how do we how do we do that? And often we use visualization as the medium to help people uh, understand those things. So which is why I have a visual and data analytics kind of coming together. And I mentioned that an alternative title for uh, this talk is the, the summary, or like the lessons learned. And uh, this is a class that I mentioned um, that I teach every semester at Georgia Tech. And I always like to show this because the very first time I taught it was at the bottom. So this is also a uh, visualization, by the way. So in 2013, in spring, uh, the first time I taught it was uh, about 35 students. And of course, this is what happened uh, to uh, last semester. So. Uh, spring 2019 have over 1,000 students because we also have the uh, online section, which alone is already have 700 uh, something students. So together, it's about uh, 1,000 students. And so, um, what I'm going to tell you uh, exactly the things that I would tell my class uh, at the end of the, uh, the of the semester, and also that's the thing that they will learn uh, through the semester. So 11 lessons, of course, there are a lot more. Uh, on more lessons, so originally it was like 9, and then they become 10, and now 11. So over time, I'd like to add more and more that uh, we, we learn. The very first thing, um, probably you would all agree, especially listen to all the lectures uh, over the few days, is that if you're working in visualization, data and analytics, machine learning, it's, it's very common that you need to learn many things. Learn many things. Um, and these days are actually a good thing, uh, because when you learn many things, uh, there's a lot of jobs that need people that have that kind of broad uh, skill set. And um, often we will be thinking about as, uh, how do you become a data scientist or like, maybe you can machine learning engineer. They, you may have many names, but often they kind of mean the same thing. And uh, sometimes pe uh, companies, you imagine they write uh, that they are looking for people like this. It's, they don't really know what they are. They just want to say people who want to, who, who, who know how to analyze data. Uh, for example, if you ever look at any uh, posting or talk to anyone working at Google, so everyone at Google is data engineer. So it's a very flat hierarchy. Uh, everyone is data engineer. But then if you really ask them what they are doing uh, from day to day, then they may tell you, oh, I'm actually building machine learning model. I'm analyzing large amount of data at, at Google. And those, you can actually call them data scientists. So data scientists uh, could be uh, how to leverage data, how to analyze data, to discover patterns, discover very useful information out of it. Uh, whatever you call them, that's up to you. Uh, but it's more about the nature of the work that they do every day is important. So often the characteristics for data scientists is that they need to know a breadth of knowledge. And the reason is that often when you're analyzing data, uh, you likely will be analyzing it for something. So something could be, um, it could be for an app developer, like who wants to service some information through an application, like on the phone, to the user. And in that case, that means the data scientists, even though you are mainly looking at data, but you will need to look, uh, work with closely uh, the app developer 
who could have a design background, who could have like a web development background. And those are skills that, as a data scientist, you might need. Uh, so you know how to use that terminology, how to communicate with them. So that's just one example. You can also imagine you're working with uh, visualization uh, folks, right? So then you would also uh, need to know that terminology, how to develop uh, effective visualization, and so on. So the good news about that is that uh, there's will only going to be more and more data. So job security. So if you're interested in visualization and data analysis, that's great. Uh, more and more data. And you may ask, like, what are the really breadth of knowledge or skills that you might need? So what are the ingredients? Um, you actually, there are quite a few. So uh, and these days, if you are, say, I'm taking a data science or introductory data science course, and I hope that they will cover a, a pretty wide uh, range of these topics. So uh, something as simple as, or simple in quote, simple as like, storage. So how do you store all this data? Um, does it still fit on a single machine, or you need to use like, cluster machines? Um, how do you uh, develop an algorithm that can work with large amount data that are now distributed among uh, a large number of uh, machines, right? So scalability algorithms, can you still use the same language? As in, are you going to be using R, or are you using Python, or do you need to ne learn new language? So uh, there are actually new libraries and uh, techniques that, that you might need to learn there. Um, and also similarly for visualization. So with, with things still fit on this, uh, all the data fit on the same screen, or even if every single data point fit on the same screen, then, then what? You probably, as a human being, you get overwhelmed. So, so that means you might need a new visualization technique. So many, many of these uh, uh, techniques. Yes? So yeah. Like you mentioned statistical tests. Yes. What kind of statistical tests do you use? Oh, so, so the question is, like, what kind of statistical tests uh, that might be relevant? Uh, I would say, I think all, all of the things that you would learn, um, even in, in, in introductory to st uh, statistics class, but the uh, challenge here is often is how do you scale up all those uh, statistics? Often, how do you compute all those across the whole data set? Or you say, oh, well, the data set is too big, so how do you uh, select the right subset so that you have a good representation of what you're capturing? So um, a lot of these, whenever you think about large amount of data, things become a lot more complex. So even sim doing simple things, simple in quote, uh, you need to think about all these. Yeah. So that, that's number one, very broad. And uh, uh, knowing the breadth of knowledge is very important. Um, so often, for example, if I'm talking to my students, uh, I rem still remember I graduated from Carnegie Mellon about seven years ago. So I'm pretty old. Uh, so seven years ago from our PhD. And uh, when we graduate, so uh, we, we talk to each other like in the same cohort. We all, all graduate and go into do our own things. Some go into industry, some go into academia. So we, we chat and I say, oh, if we were to do our PhD again, ever again, how would we want to change things? And one very common theme that came up was that everyone wished that during the first year, second year, that they went much broader than they had. So the reason is that for PhD often is they, by definition, if you want to finish PhD, you need to write a thesis. And thesis need to be very deep, deep in whatever thesis area, thesis topic that you choose. On the other hand, being broad is not a prerequisite. So that means if you finish your PhD, well, you're guaranteed to be very deep. And actually, sometimes it's so deep, it becomes a niche area. Um, but on the other hand, these days you work in industry especially, uh, it's very important that you know how to communicate, how to you make your, what you're an expert uh, in to, to be, become relevant, or to, how do you talk about it to other people outside of your field. So that is one common theme that uh, actually, right, well, after we are done with PhD, then say, OK, so that, that is the thing that we wish we did. Uh, so that's interesting uh, information. So that's lesson one. Lesson two um, is, I would say, uh, very general, not only by, uh, for data science, but I think just in life in general, uh, and life, life, life lesson, um, is that uh, when you are learning, learning these uh, many things, uh, a, broad, a broad set of skills, focus on the concepts and generalizable uh, techniques instead of say, oh, I'm not going to learn algorithm number one, algorithm number two, algorithm number three. And that can help future-proof yourself. Um, because every day, if you're already writing paper or you read a lot of paper, you'll notice that every day there's tens, hundreds of papers that are published. And even in the field that you're working in, right? so every time there's a new conference, there's a large number of papers. So that's impossible to read all the papers. Right? And also, so many papers, sometimes you don't really know even that which one is good, which one is really people are using, and so on. So it takes a lot of time to do it. So um, on the other hand, you focus on concepts and generalizable techniques. And that means that really core principles, things that you will see that get reviews again and again. Even they say when someone say that a paper or like a technique is new, often it's a variation of things that have been out there uh, for a while, or a combination of skills. So focus on those, like the core elements. Um, that will help 
make yourself less overwhelmed because you say, oh, I need to learn like 1,000 new things. Well, not really. Actually, you really boil it down. That is probably be maybe a 10, a 20 of things. So much, much smaller number. And uh, if you're only starting in, the, in, in this uh, area, then I would recommend a book. It's called Data Science for Business. And this is a book that uh, written by uh, Fossil Provost and uh, his colleague, Tom, and they're at uh, NYU uh, Business School. And I recommend it is, is because that the way that it, it uh, covered the topics, relevant topic, is that it focused on the principles. So it doesn't go through algorithm by algorithm, which you will know very well that well things can 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 outdate it or things can we discover a lot of papers every day. So um, particularly, there's a quote that I want to uh, put out is that says the a critical skill in data science ability to com decompose a data analytics problem into pieces, right? So that's the important part. De decompose it into uh, pieces. And then also recognize what's familiar. Like recognize familiar problems and solution and avoid wasting time. So if something's already solved, well, just use whatever solution there, or at least try those first. Right? No need to re reinvent the, the wheel so that you can focus your energy and your time on the parts that probably may not have solved yet or may not have been solved uh, really well or may, it may require human involvement. So those, those are where innovation can come in. So that means that for whenever you have like a big problem, right, a big problem maybe at, at work, at research, at, uh, in industry, like figure out which part already solved. So then at least start with the, some known solution. Uh, it doesn't mean that known solutions are always good, but at least that's a good starting point. You don't need to say, oh, let's build everything from scratch. So that would be overkill. So the great news is that um, the, the principle number of principle is not that many. Uh, so there's only nine, nine of them. And I'm not going to go, go through all of them. Some of them you already heard, heard about, like classification, uh, regression, um, clustering. So those you may already heard, heard a lot. And some might be, uh, you may, yet be less familiar with, but there's already also a lot of te techniques out there with something called co-occurrence grouping, uh, many names for it. Sometimes they call it frequent, it frequent items mining, association with discovery market basket dis analysis. Uh, one thing, uh, I hope, like after uh, three days, you will notice that uh, people working in data science, machine learning, and so on, they're very good at coming up with fancy names that mean very simple things. Um, so number five is <laughs> the reason. So originally, when it first came out, it's called market basket analysis. I can give you an uh, example for that. Um, so the reason it's called market basket analysis because originally it was used in uh, grocery store analysis. And you're looking at what are the items that people often buy in grocery store. So interesting uh, discovery would be that uh, it turned out that people like to buy diapers and beer uh, a lot. They may, oh, why, why is that? Right? So it turned out that a lot of times they go shopping, you say, oh, baby need diaper, and then some, oh, but we also need beer. So they buy. So it turned out th those are the kind of things that are often uh, are bought together. And similarly, man, they're like uh, butter and bread, right? So that would be uh, bought a lot. So that they call the market basket analysis, as in if you, you go to a grocery store, what do the uh, people usually put in the, the basket? Right. But of course, you can imagine finding these that are common co-occurrence is a very common thing that uh, people would like to do, not only for a grocery store, right? So as in something like if you're watching movies right, or buying things on Amazon, what are the things that uh, most likely you want to buy together, right? So which is why the co-occurrence grouping is a very big category of techniques. And also another example, uh, also different names. You can call it profiling, you can call it pattern mining, anomaly detection. A lot of them really boiling down to how to discover uh, general patterns over a large amount of data set. And there the application would be now you can say if you're uh, sometimes you have a credit card, right? So then you may get a call from a credit card company and say, hey, there's an anomaly happening. Uh, usually you are buying things in Atlanta, but now all of a sudden, like today, you're, I don't know, in Alaska, right? So something's wrong. So what they, they have been doing is to look at your pattern, your shopping pattern, when do you usually buy, what a geographic location that you're in. And by doing so, or building a profile for you, or maybe just by using their data, or you're comparing people similar to you, uh, then they can say, OK, that might be an anomaly. And these are all closely related because if you want to find anomalies or weird things, let's say in network, uh, say some intrusion detection. So those are done because, or possible because you know what is common, what is normal. So then you can tell what is uh, an anomaly. Right. So those are some examples. So all these, are, you will say, well, there are a lot of techniques out there, but then if you're really boiling down to the principle, the core idea is fortunately that not that many. So which is why it's, it's great. I think it's a read that book. I don't have any uh, relations with the author, so I can recommend without any reservation. So that's a good book. Uh, you go to Amazon, you'll see it's five star, uh, pretty good book. Yeah. So that's number two. And uh, number three, uh, how many of you have worked with data, real data already? Real data, ah, very good. How many 
how many um, how many of you have done like data cleaning? Like data cleaning, like uh, oh, okay, very good. So, uh, for those of you who have not uh, done it yet, highly encourage you to do it uh, because it's usually pretty eye-opening. Even for data that you will say, oh, just download it from the web. It's all like in one zip file. Everything is nice. Or like you have the database. I'm already collected it. You will realize that whenever you work with real data, uh, unavoidably it's going to be dirty. Uh, even you will say that it's all clean, but it's actually not clean. Uh, the main reason is because often data are generated by people. And people are the culprit. So whenever there are people, there are problems. So people like are lazy, which is why they say, "Oh, I'm doing right. I want to write the whole long sentence and write an acronym." Right. Once they do acronym, that like person A write acronym A, and then person B then they write another way. Right. Or there's if you're um, uh, uh, like uh, if you do a lot of programming, sometimes you notice uh, the uh, the bug that's Hardest to catch is the one with what the trailing white space that you do not see, and you just throw in error to you. So, so those are some additional data during us the problem that you see. So, uh, it's never going to go away. So, there's always have been data during us, and there always will be. So, for that reason, uh, it's good to 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 know how to handle uh, handle these. And also, a lot of times, if the data is not collected, uh, even we're talking about uh, major tech companies, often you end up spending a lot of time on uh, data cleaning. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad thing, because you'll notice that whenever you really work with the data, you really look at the dirty data, you actually gain understanding of the data. So there is some, some benefit for it. But at the same time, there's also a lot of uh, such work is, is very manual. You actually want to automate it as much as possible. So garbage in, garbage out. So very important to first clean data. And I already get, uh, talk about some of the example. But if you're not convinced yet, then here's another additional example. Even writing the dates, right? Depending on where you're British, American, you can swap the month and dates, right? So that's one example. And many other examples, like writing duplicates, empty rows, abbreviation, a lot of trailing space, uh, missing values, all those things, yes. Uh, this is still true, so as I mentioned, that most of the time we'll still be spending on uh, data preparation. And uh, this is a pie chart. So pie chart, donut chart, actually, in a few slides, we'll say it's not a good thing. But this is uh, pulled from a, uh, an article, so I'm going to use the, the, the donut chart here. So here it's saying that 60% is on cleaning and organizing data, and then 19% 19, 19% is on collecting data sets. So all that is already 80%. And then uh, if you haven't done any data cleaning yet, or you have uh, been taking like, maybe more uh, introductory classes, machine learning classes, like, oh, okay, so I'm going to do all those exciting analysis or doing visualization. It turned out that those are like 9%, 4%, so tiny, tiny, tiny bit. So majority of your time is spent on that. Um, in other words, we are all data janitors. Uh, we are all, all trying to do some sort of uh, data cleaning. And, but the nice thing about it is that uh, it's, it's not easy. It's actually pretty hard. So uh, during, during Know how to how to do it is important, and uh, fortunately there are some good tools out there uh, that can help you do it. Like one tool that I a student would, would work with in my class is the tool called Open Refine. Originally it's called Google Refine. Uh, they open source it now. It's called Open Refine. So this is a tool, open source tool. You can download it using your own computer, and it can handle data up to a couple gigabyte. It's not like industry scale, but it's it's very good for education use, and it has a lot of functions. So uh, for cleaning all sorts of data problems. So this is uh, there. It has like a, a gem here. I think, of course, like Google Refine or Open Refine, they wanted to mean like uh, getting the, the gem out of data. But then I would also say this is actually a hidden gem. So uh, there's one a few years ago, a company approached me uh, when I'm teaching. They said, oh, hey, Polo, so we have this. Uh, uh, tool that you'd like you to uh, introduce your student uh, so that they will use it. So actually, we get a lot of those requests. Um, the company like to engage uh, with educators so that we will cover or, or teach things so that the student will use it. So then I ask that company, OK, what is your, the product that you have? If it's really good our student, well, I, I will think about it. Right? And I say, well, this is for data cleaning. And I said, OK, so do you know that I saw a, de uh, saw a demo? And oh, it's good. It's a good number of functions. But all of them were actually uh, possible with OpenRefine. So I asked the company, uh, so do you know about OpenRefine or Google Refine? And they did not know it. So which is, which is uh, interesting, because I mean, they, whole, they build a whole company on a product. Uh, and this is something that the, the open source tool can do, but then they did not know about it. So this is a very mature tool that developed over a number of years, originally uh, from Google, and now it's open. So definitely uh, tried it. Uh, you can run in browser. A uh, one in browser doesn't mean that it's, it's not scalable, because it's now run can be run locally on your computer. 
and it's local on browser, it can actually read from your disk. And not, no data is sent to Google or anyone. So I uh, highly recommend that you check it out. If you have that data that's up to, um, I think, say, multiple gigabyte of data, it can handle it. Yeah. OK, so that is number three. Number four, this is controversial, I know that. How many of you use R quite a lot? R, oh, OK. How many use Python? Oh, OK, good, yes. So originally, I said it's Python is like, it's the king, and then someone say, no, 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 that's wrong. So, so now, now I say Python is a king, because there could be more than one king. So uh, R could, could also be very popular. And so in practice, and uh, you would probably want to use whichever ones that have good community support. So both of them have very good community support, I know. And, but then in the context of they are working with tech companies, so often Python is more popular. I'll explain why. Uh, for example, a company like Google, most familiar with, I interned there before and also work with them now, is uh, Python is one, often one of the big three languages. Uh, if you ever inter interview with Google, uh, the first thing that they will do is they have the, a uh, what they call a tech interview. Right? That means programming interview. And they don't really care about which languages that you might be using. If they say, oh, I know I'm familiar with Java, that's fine. Actually, usually they ask you to write pseudocode, so it doesn't really matter. But once you get an offer, you join a company, then you will notice that uh, most of the functions uh, used in a, uh, at Google, uh, they would have all the three Python, Java, and C++ uh, API, or like the uh, yeah, support, like documentation, all those. And Java and C++, those are the other two. And if you really want to squeeze out every single bit of performance, uh, which Google really care a lot, like every single millisecond count, when you do a query, they want to return as quickly as possible, then they will use C++. Right? So that's, that's probably the fastest, unless you go to assembly, uh, fastest, as fastest for C++. But on the other hand, there's also a lot of things happening at Google, like maybe uh, data engineer, data scientists at Google, uh, they want to try something out right, very quickly. Then often they turn to uh, Python, so some scripting, writing some scripting. And also, uh, Python is very good at what we call as a glue language. So glue, as in it worked really well with others, generally pretty easy compared to other languages. I don't know if you ever tried to call something other languages from Java. It's a pain. Uh, Java is my, my, uh, my language when I, when I grew up uh, doing my PhD. So I, I used to use Java a lot. But now my student and I, we also switch to Python uh, exactly because it's that we need to pull uh, call a lot of other things. And also, uh, Python has a lot of libraries, much more library, much easier to run, and um, also uh, not sure if you also notice, like uh, writing Java application or running Java application these days on, let's say, on Mac is much, much harder, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a reason why. Yes. Many questions. Yes. Oh, is, is Java initially built on C++? Uh, it takes a lot of ideas from C++, and I think some of the acceleration are actually wrapped around uh, C++. And actually, even Python, too. So Python, some of the libraries, when they say, oh, I have a speed that com uh, comparable to like the same C++, it's actually wrapped around C++. Uh, the syntax is very different. Yeah, syntax is very. So you very, quite, quite different. You'll notice that uh, uh, a lot of these languages, actually, they are kind of taking ideas from each other. For example, Java, now they also uh, support like they got functional programming, taking from Scala and and so on, and so the kind of things are merging. Usually, they look at like which which languages are doing well, and they try to add the element into it without uh, making it very very bloated. Okay, um, yeah. So so these are big. Uh, in, if you're talking about tech companies, so often like Python, Java, and C++ are the are the three main languages, uh, which is why if you're thinking, oh, in the future, uh, I made mean, I would like to work at that company, and that's a good good one to do. And of course, it, you know, R doesn't mean that you cannot work there. So uh, as I mentioned, usually for the interview, they don't really care. They only care about uh, how you think about things, how you how you write pseudocode. So exact language doesn't really care. Uh, doesn't really matter. And once you start working, well, of course, you can learn anything you want. And of course, there's also a lot more li uh, languages uh, like used in tech company, not just D3. But these are the, the kind of the, uh, we'll call the, the, the ones that are more conventional, more traditional, has the biggest support at these companies. Yeah. So the number four. And number five, um, this, these uh, often get overlooked, which is why I like to include it. So how many of you already taken algorithm data structure class? OK. How about uh, SQL relational databases? 
Okay, a few hands. So if you haven't, then I highly recommend uh, that you learn about them. Maybe take a class or maybe uh, learn about it, read about it, maybe take some online classes also. And the reason is that uh, algorithms and uh, uh, data structure or like how do you an analyze algorithm using like big no notation and so on, or also how do you query uh, data from relational databases. Um, so those are, I would say, pretty essential skill. Often, if you're thinking about uh, going into a data science and a job description may not even talk about it. Like you say, oh, we want the idea scientists, and then they will list all the other like techniques and things, but they don't really mention these. But then they do assume that you know, you know that. Um, so interesting story. So uh, there's a Georgia Tech alum. A couple of years back, they they come back. Actually, I think they do it every year. But the, the lunch I joined was a couple of years back. So they came back, and then uh, we had a lunch with uh, some of the faculty, Georgia faculty. I was, I was one of them. And uh, so over lunch, we asked them, "Oh, so it was great. Uh, thanks for coming back. So uh, what what was the things that you did, or they did?" Uh, at Georgia Tech that make them Google ready. We call Google ready, so that means like how do you, what, what do you do at Georgia Tech that makes you be able to, to get an offer or get a job at Google. And uh, the number one thing they said is data structure and algorithm. So uh, if you're at Georgia Tech, there's a course called uh, CS1332, that's exactly algorithm and data structure. Um, and that, uh, one reason is that because it's also often the things that uh, these interview, tech interviews would ask about. So often uh, they would say, uh, here's a problem, uh, write some pseudo code and then solve it. And in the beginning, often they would say, uh, a, a concrete example is say, there's a two arrays, a two arrays of numbers, and find a common element that appear in both arrays. And they say, oh well, I can just like put each array of number into set, set A, set B, and then do intersection. Well, that's one way. That's the correct way to do it. But usually they don't want to ask. They don't want to start that easy. They would say, well. Two arrays of number solve a problem without using any library, without using any set map, and so on. That means you now you need to go back to the very, very fundamental, the old boring for for loop and like array using pointers and so on. And you may say, ask why. The reason is that they want to know how you think about things, how you work under constraints. So one big skill I would say in uh, in, in data science or working with data uh, data is that you want to know that. If, where there's limitations, so how do you go around it? How do you address them? So that is what a lot of uh, interviews are. They want to know how you think about things. If you are giving a lot of constraints, what you would you do? Uh, so that means what happened usually is, well, we write a slow version of the solution. It's correct, but slow. And then the interviewer may say, OK, well, that's correct, but now how do you make it faster? Then it's, OK, now you can use set. Right? Then you can use set then, well, then much, much and, and they say, well, if you use that one, there's also constraints. So set is not free, right? Putting everything in a set, what's the memory constraint? So what is the time complexity? That's where you may want to learn about like big O notation. How do you analyze your algorithm? How fast is it? Now if you say, if the two array, each one is like one billion entry. So how fast is it going to be? How do you scale up? So they like to try to know about it. So by taking data structure and algorithm classes, you learn about those basics. You know, OK, when I, my data uh, start to get bigger, this is the price I pay. This is the uh, storage that I would need. Right? So that's just an example for the algorithm part. And similarly for SQL uh, or relational database also, uh, a lot of companies these days, they will say, oh, we're moving away from relational databases. We don't use SQL. We don't use Oracle. We have our own uh, big data storage and so on. So, and it's OK, sure. But you'll notice that in the end, whenever you need to pull data out of, from, the, from those databases, non-relational, non-SQL database, you are still writing similar SQL uh, uh, sim uh, uh, kind of syntax. So that means even though the data Databases may not be relational or may not directly be relational, um, but a lot of time the, the program or the script that you write is still relational. So that means uh, knowing the basics. Uh, you may, need, may not need to take a full class, uh, course for a database, but knowing like how the query work, what uh, indexing, for example, for database work. So those are those are good information. Um, and these are things that often the, uh, the 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 job description or an employer they kind of assume that you know and. And uh, when you start in the job or when you do interview, they say, like, what, what, you, still, you don't know this? And they go shocked and then, no, 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 OK, no job for you. Um, so so learn, learn about those. Uh, you may not take big class, uh, the whole class on it, but at least know the, you know, the basics. That will be very helpful. So now number five. Number six, and can talk a little bit about visualization. Finally. I noticed that uh, this class is supposed to be, uh, a tutorial is supposed to be visualization. There's uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, data analytics, but now I can uh, talk a bit about visualization. So 
how many of you are familiar with visualization, taking visualization classes, no visualization basics? Some hands. OK, a few hands, OK. Um, so visualization, and there's a general perception whenever someone says, oh, I do visualization, or I do data visualization, the first reaction they have, oh, you're making things uh, look pretty. <laughs> and well, yes, that's true. Uh, aesthetics is important. So you do make things pretty. But more important, when someone say, if you're doing visualization research especially, is to come up with an effective design, effective visualization design uh, with the goal to communicate. So if you're doing data analysis, are you going to show all the raw numbers? Right? You are going to compute all the statistics. Are you going to show all those raw numbers to people? Or is there a better way to do it? And often the better way is through visualization. So visualization to help communicate the finding and uh, discovery and with the goal of helping people gain insight. So those are actually the goal of visualization. Making things pretty is important because it helps people understand. So a lot of people are very visual. So through the visualization, they can gain insight. They can better communicate much faster. So that, that, that's the actual goal. So some people say, uh, I don't see any reason for that I need visualization. That's especially common if you're talking to uh, hardcore machine learning people. Like uh, they say, automate everything, I press a button, my algorithm is perfect, 100% accuracy, it's never wrong. So I don't see why I need human being. I don't see why I need to show the visualization to human being at all. So, so here's a good example to con convince you. Some of them may have seen it already. Uh, same data set, actually all these four data set would give you the same uh, statistics, if you compute the mean, so this is by variate, like two, two, uh, two variables. And if you compute the mean, they are the same. Compute the variance, they would be the same. Even if you compute, do a regression on all the four data set, it will give you the same straight line. Right? But now if you really look at it, visualize them, then you'll see that they are very different, that they should be very different. Right? So often, what you might have in your head, when someone say, "Oh, mean is this, variance is this," you might, say, "Oh, okay, it's probably like this. Like, like uh, uh, you have a line. Well, of course, it's around a line, right?" But then you'll notice, well, even for data in this shape, you will still give you the same mean, same variance, same fit. Or you may even have anomalies which screw up uh, uh, regression, right? You will say, "Well, this is outlier. That's fine. Well, yes, outlier. That's that's a very real problem in real data." And you say, well, that's an anomaly. That's OK. I don't think it happened a lot. Well, then this is another reason, another thing where you could actually see another more extreme anomaly. They also give you the same thing. So this is a very famous, we call Anscombe Quartet. So uh, same statistics, uh, but once you visualize the data, you realize, realize that they're very, very different. So usually once you show this, then uh, people understand, OK, well, yes, there's a lot of uh, value in visualizing data, as simple as, in this case, just showing the data. Right. We're not even doing anything fancy. Right. Plot the scatter plot, and then that's it. And you might then also, oh, OK, well, so uh, doing a scatter plot, is that too simple? Like, if you're making things pretty, right, uh, help people communicate, gain insight, shouldn't we go for a like, very fancy thing? So it turned out, no. Uh, doing visualization doesn't really mean that doing fancy thing. So keep in mind, because the goal is to help communicate. Right, communicate and gain insight. So whatever chart, whatever design that's effective, then you should use those. It turned out to be actually not that hard. It's easy, easy as in because even simple charts that often people discount that, oh, it's too basic. Simple charts as bar charts or line charts, right? Or uh, line chart or scatter plot. So those, I would say, cover probably 90% of all the visualization that we we'll use in practice. They are very effective very easy uh, for people to understand. And that's great, because then you, people need to like, study a whole manual to understand what's happening. So the reason that these are effective and good at communicating is because I take, take advantage of people's perception. So people are really good at telling difference between length, so which is why bar chart is great. So very easy to even detect small uh, differences. And also line chart, for example, is good for uh, visualizing trends. So you, through the line uh, continuity, it's very easy to see that. So it doesn't need to be uh, complex. And so that means visualization. You want to develop vis effective visualization, not very hard. Uh, of course, there are, are some principles. Uh, as long as you know the principles, and then you can, everyone can create a very effective chart. So what are some principles? So not covering all of them, but some of the, the most important put in one. And one common uh, thing that people will do, uh, especially when they start learning, doing visualization, is that, well, OK, visualization, you need to make it pretty, right? I'm going to throw in some color. Right? 
So try, try to resist that, that, uh, that, that urge. So you actually generally recommend students to first start with grayscale. So you think grayscale, like, like I write the spectrum, and start with that. If you really think that it's valuable to add color for highlight to emphasize things that are important, then gradually add those in. And you will notice that even for using grayscale, it can be tricky. So here, for example, like all the t three tiny rectangle, gray rectangle, uh, there, and I'm not going to quiz you, but, but if you really look at the one at the left, you notice this is quite dark. You look at the run to the right, it's quite light, right? But if you take out the background, so all four uh, tiny square in the middle, they're actually exactly the same uh, grayscale value. And you may say, why is that? The reason is because our perception system, what we see is highly influenced by what is around it. So having a gradient in the background is in the uh, influence um, that what we perceive as dark and or lighter. Right? So that's one. So that means even grayscale, even in this game, no color. The actual grayscale is still color, but most people don't, don't consider, consider it as color. Um, so even that uh, can be tricky. Right? So start with that first. And then another thing also very important to know is uh, there's color blindness. So I showed that uh, about 10% of the population uh, cannot see uh, the differentiate between certain colors. So you need to take that into account. So which is why you don't want to just say, ah, visualization, I'm going to throw all the data, all the color in it. So some people cannot see it. Right? Actually, even for male, uh, uh, color blindness is particularly more common. And also sometimes if you th use the color and, and uh, not carefully, you will get something like this. Uh, you may recognize this is the map of the US, but it also looked like the US is on fire. Uh, the reason is that you pick a, a bad color scheme, right? So it turned out that it's like uh, blue to red, and that wool is a whole uh, southern part, like including Atlantis on fire. Um, so you want to be careful um, when picking color scheme, right? So, so those are su just some of the, the principles. So, and also that um, you want to make sure you are doing the right thing. Uh, it's very easy to lie. I don't encourage you to lie, but recognize that it's very easy to lie, including uh, this is from uh, Steve Jobs. Right? Uh, I think it's right when uh, iPhone came out. So it gave a presentation and showed how well the iPhone is doing. So iPhone is, Apple is in green, the big slice here. And then they have other, like Blackberry is still there, uh, so in blue. And they said, oh, so uh, Apple is doing so well. Right? So can, can anyone tell me what, what the, what is some problem here in this slide? So this is created by Apple, Steve Shop must be right, right? So it must be good. Uh, yeah, uh, anyone who, yes? Samsung. Uh, Samsung, yeah, Samsung not there yet, I think. Yeah, I think it's the Apple and then and, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Motorola, I forgot the history, yeah, yeah, sorry. But yeah, yeah this, this is 2007, it's, it's a very first iPhone. So I don't remember who, I don't know who remember the history, but, but that, at that point, like, uh, Blackberry was dominating and then kind of Apple came out. And oh, there's still Palm, Palm, Palm Pilot. Uh, but any, any problem? So not, not about the data, but more about the, the visualization, this part. What are some problems there? Or why, why, if you are Apple, why would you want to show this chart? This way. Yes, very good. So 21, this is 21.2%, the purple slice. But then 19.5, which is lower, right? Lower than 21, but it looked big. Why is it big? Why does the green one look big? Because tilted, right? So this is what we call 2.5D chart. So first of all, pie chart is bad. Pie chart is bad as in if you want to make a very accurate comparison, it's quite hard because this is angled. So it's not as easy as pie chart. I'm sorry, uh, bar chart, for example. Bar chart is it's much easier from the length. Here, you, you rely on angle. That means you somehow need to mentally rotate the, the, the slices and then compare. And then the other, the other problem is the tilting. So uh, the 3D, make it looking 3D. And of course, the Apple market team is very clever. They put Apple down there so that when it tilt towards the audience, it looks bigger, right? It wouldn't put like up there, right? So, so, so that's why it's very easy to lie. So if you want to design, oh, I'm showing data. Data visualization must be right, must be accurate. No, it's highly dependent on how you show it, right? And also another example, anyone can tell me what's the problem with this, uh, this bar chart? You may have seen this a lot, actually, in research paper. They say, Let's see, you can see our, our method is so much big, better. Like, ooh, yes, much better than, our, than the other method. What's the problem? 
Ah, uh, okay. So, so you can see the tiny attack. So they start with set, start with 75, 75 to 100. So the so when you're doing bar chart, always start at zero whenever possible, because here if you don't look at the uh, the x x or the, the vertical axis label, visually you will say, well, this is four times as as high, right? But it's not really. It's 70 or 80 compared to to a 100. It's only like about 20. 20, yeah, twenty dollar increase, right? So this is another way to lie. Pretty easy, you turn out. And this is another one. This is a, 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 a screenshot from uh, the BP oil oil spill. You may remember a couple, of, quite a few years back, uh, uh, the oil spill, and then their representatives say, "Oh, we are doing great in collecting the oil from the from the sea." So they show a chart. A chart. Wow, they look really great, right? So it's collecting more and more and more and more over time. But then if you look at the tiny tank, it's a cumulative. So problem with cumulative, it always increases. In the worst case, it's flattened. So it still looks really, really good. So that's another good way. So of course, they create that, that make that slide with an intention. Right? They'll say, oh, we're doing great. But you really look at like per day, then it actually decreases. The collection, actual collection rate actually decreases. Right? So, so these are also some principle in this case, like how do you not mislead? And sometimes intentionally, so definitely don't do it. And also know that how to fix the problem if someone do try and do it. Right? Call them out. That was number six. Number seven, um, you would say, oh, I don't, I don't know uh, if I, uh, I want to spend a lot of energy on, on doing visualization. I don't know what to start. And what would be some, some good way to, to begin? And in my class, um, I forced all the students to learn a library called D3. How many of you already heard of D3 JavaScript? D3? OK, some of you. And so there, now there is some, some high level, too. So D3, if you haven't, haven't heard of it, uh, it's not Diablo 3, by the way. So D3, uh, so you, go, you Google a D3 uh, web library. So this is a library that's often used, or the, the kind of library behind a lot of the web-based visualization that you may have seen. For example, like Wall Street Journal, um, on New York Times, a lot of the interactive graphics that are actually built on top of D3. And D3 uh, visualization, the, uh, at the bottom here is some of the, the example charts that, that you can create using it. So this is programming. So D3 is a combination of uh, JavaScript, CSS, uh, HTML. So the benefit for uh, having all these, these are web standard li uh, um, uh, languages, right? And that means all more than uh, browsers support them, so including uh, your phone. So that means if you build a visualization using these uh, this D3 libraries, you can show it in any platform, right? Which is really attractive. And another big thing uh, why it's helpful is that uh, it can allow you to build interactive things. So interactive, as in some of the recent work that uh, we developed with Google and with Facebook, they're built on top of D3. So oh, I'm going to go back to. Number seven, actually. So some of some of them will show so quickly, and the reason the reason that why you might want to learn maybe a little bit of it, maybe even even knowing the the basics, is that uh, being able to create the visualization or maybe using it as part of uh, a maybe a system or a tool. That you allow people to interact with the data or interact with your discovery. So a lot of times uh, when you do analysis. And of course, you have the static output, but a lot of times you cannot fit everything into one screen, right? Or may not be able to show everything. And also, a lot of times that uh, what the questions that people have in mind, they may not uh, come up all of a sudden. Usually, it's more interactive. You show them the main finding, and then they may ask, "Oh, wait. So how do you reach this particular finding?" So if you uh, provide interactive visualization, uh, that you allow them to ask questions, and then through that uh, to Maybe going to the uh, to the data, uh, drilling down, and then discover what's happening. And a uh, benefit of using a library like that, as I mentioned uh, briefly, is you can build interactive uh, visualization. And and because these uh, libraries now you can run uh, supported in browser, so you can build tools like this is a recent work with Google called GANLAB, and for playing with a we call generative adversarial network. How many of you heard about it? Gang, G A N. Ah, some of you. So uh, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, you probably have read a lot about it on, in the news already. Uh, you have seen some of these um, fake 
uh, faces, like celebrity faces, or like the faces that are not really for real people, but then it look real to human being. And but then how it's generated is actually through uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, model that by through analyzing a large number of images, then they can create these uh, seemingly real but fake uh, 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 data. We may also have uh, seen in the news like there's the what this Airbnb doesn't exist, this person doesn't exist, exists like website that you can go in and check out. So all those are actually not real, but then it's able to be generated by machine learning. So this is an interactive tool that we developed with Google uh, to help uh, students, especially to learn about these uh, latest technology. It turned out that a lot of these underlying techniques we call general adversarial network or gang uh, is very complex. Uh, complex as in hard to really train the model to gen be able to generate realistic. Uh, data. So here, through an interactive user interface, we allow the uh, uh, student to learn, OK, if the green green dot here is the real data, real data that you want to imitate, as in think about uh, images, as in like real faces. right? So how do you generate realistic looking uh, faces? That's the green dots. In this case, the user say, ah, I want to want the uh, fake data to look like a ring, like distributed like a ring. So that's how what the user has drawn. Um, and then here, iteratively, you say that, see that the fake data in purple is, is generated or warp around so that uh, in the end, after many, many iterations, then it looks like a real thing. So through uh, the interactive user interface, it allows people to, to play with the different parameters and, and, and to learn, learn how that works. And also another uh, project with Facebook, uh, internally, you may know say, well, uh, so for tech company, they must have a lot of tools internally to help them understand uh, what all the model, machine learning model, uh, deep learning model are working. Uh, they turn out that they, they still need visualization tool, like even at a the, at the very large scale. So Activist is one of the recent tools that uh, our group developed with them. It's now deployed on the machine learning platform to understand uh, what their uh, deep learning models are working. Uh, particularly, they want to know when their model doesn't work. You may say, wow, tech company, most of the models are working really well. Well, yes, but also a lot of times they don't work well. Uh, so for companies, they, they particularly want to know when it doesn't and then how to debug them, So which is why they, they need visualization too like that. And number nine, uh, going back to a little bit more on the big data side. And uh, similar to algorithms and SQL, uh, I'd say a lot of times uh, companies do expect you to know at least some of the basic big data technology. So some of the, the earlier ones, including like Hadoop or Spark. Oh, how many of you already heard of it? How about Hadoop and Spark? OK, oh, good, good. So if you haven't, so you can read a little bit about it. Uh, you can even go to Wikipedia. Uh, that, that's, that's fine, perfectly fine. And uh, so why do I say uh, you need to learn, know a little bit about big data uh, technology is because uh, most likely, uh, if you are working with companies or even for research, and a lot of times you need to work with a large amount of data. Uh, large may not even be large, large. It could be even like gigabyte, right? So sometimes it's already big enough that a lot of algorithms do not work. And for tech, tech company, of course, uh, they might be even bigger. It could, even like years ago, they are already uh, collecting petabyte of data per day. And this is common not only for tech company, but also even uh, in movie, like movie creation. Now you have all the CGI and all those. Those can be petabyte of data. And if you're looking even in sciences, for example, uh, you can at the CERN, for example, they have like petabytes, hundreds of petabytes of data. Um, actually, a lot of students in my class, they are from non-computing background. And, then, and I'm always curious to know why they want to take, take the class. And often they say, well, I'm in, like, working in engineering, in sciences, and, but now I need to work with real data, like large amount of data. And I don't know how to do it. So that means now uh, knowing these data analysis skills or knowing how the big data technology, how to store them, how to write uh, algorithms that can run on those, those have become pretty essential. So some of the earlier ones, uh, uh, one thing, for example, uh, Hadoop, have been around for quite a while, and these say often people say uh, they kind of kind of phase, phase out a little bit. Uh, that's that's correct, but also the foundation are still there. So at a very high level, what Hadoop and other system is, uh, a lot of them are open source, and it's meant to uh, provide what we call a scalable or distributed computing platform. So you, in, the, in the high level, you can think of it as, well, if your data is so big, it doesn't fit in a single machine. You know, so how, how do you store all this data across, let's say, hundreds or thousands of machines? So in top, the deployment, often these Hadoop clusters are over hundreds and thousands of machines. Um, and the goal there is to, by having these hundreds and thousands of machines, you can uh, provide what we call linear scalability, as in with two machines twice as fast, one year a machine 100 times as fast. Uh, that's a, a, the ultimate goal, uh, the, the best case scenario. But of course, in practice, we don't get see that linear uh, scalability. But 
anything closer to it is great. And also very importantly, uh, a lot of time these distributed systems they provide at the, the very last point, fault tolerance. Um, so that means if say your machine dies, when a machine dies, one of the, uh, the data set get corrupted, it's able to uh, regenerate it automatically. So this is a huge thing because machines die a lot. So actually Google published like an art article uh, years back, they say about 3% of the hard drive die within the first month. So that's a lot of hard drive dying, right? You've got, they have like tens of thousands of hard drives, 3% is thousands of hard drives that just die in the first, first, uh, first month. And why you want to uh, learn these technologies? Because now this use used in almost all uh, companies, especially like Fortune 500 company, they use it a lot of activity in research, uh, strong community support, so which means they're not going away, which is great, right? And uh, they're also free, free uh, that when you want to make it bold. A lot of the times these say when you are using library, every library said it's free, right? Free as in yes, you can just download it, but it doesn't mean that you can run it very well. Actually, the most costly thing in working with big data, data technologies, uh, these say is the people. So how do you hire the right person uh, for your company that have the skill set to tune this cluster, to know what you're doing, how to optimize it? So that is not free. So often the software is still free, but then the support, the know-how is not free. Okay. So just want to mention that. And a lot of companies consider essential skills. Again, they may not write about it in the job description, but then once you start working, they say, oh, wait, what? You don't know this? Yes. Um, so that's one. And then the other closely related, these days are pretty popular, Spark. And I'm not going to go through all the, all the details. The reason that you want, learn, you want to learn about it is because it solves a main problem in the, in the older Hadoop, original Hadoop uh, way. So if you use, want to use the original Hadoop, uh, the data is stored on disk. And if you're having an algorithm that needs, let's say, machine learning algorithm, very iterative, man, need to run many iterations. What it does for Hadoop is that you will need to uh, read the data from disk, and then after doing the computation, write that intermediate uh, result back to disk. So you, that means if your algorithm needs to run 1,000 iterations, you need to do that 1,000 times. So every time you hit the disk, read, read from disk, write to disk, is very slow. So Spark is aimed to solve that problem uh, by keeping the intermediate data in memory. So, so that's the main, main thing. It's also now very popular uh, and used in a lot of companies as well. So I'm going to skip those. Let's skip that. And yeah, one is, uh, something that you will hear a lot, uh, especially these say that is data science, the AI is so hot, uh, is whenever something uh, comes out, and then some other people will say, oh, well, OK, so it replaces like, whatever uh, uh, thing is get, getting you. Let's say that th this is from Reddit, so it must be real. Uh, actually, in this case, it's true. So uh, someone was saying, OK, Google dumps met reduce in favor of new hyperscale analytics system. But then if you zoom in uh, here, it says, a Google, I'm, as an employee, Google employee, I was surprised by this headline considering I just ran some map reduce this past week. So what this is saying is that there was some announcement that Google released some uh, new product they call Hyperscale Analytics System, whatever. And then immediately, someone said, OK, so Google is dumping whatever system they're using. Right. So this is wrong. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this get, uh, uh, now it's part of Wikipedia. So now, actually, now a lot of people thought it's real. But this is wrong. The main reason is, in, as in this employee said, is because uh, you can't really replace technology, especially uh, a, a technology that embedded in a lot of existing code um, overnight. So usually a process. It may very well be Google's ultimate goal to replace it, but then you cannot do it. Let's say I announce it, and then the next morning, everything is gone. And also, another thing why it's not accurate is because often for a technology, let's say for Hadoop or Spark, usually we don't talk about it as a single thing. It's actually an ecosystem of techniques. For example, for Hadoop, often we say it's a Hadoop ecosystem or a Spark ecosystem. The reason is because in that is there are many components in it. For example, for Hadoop, there's a component, the storage component, which actually Spark would use because Spark itself doesn't provide the storage layer. So it uses Hadoop as a bottom layer. So for that reason, you cannot say, I'm just going to throw away Hadoop. Well, you can use, replace some of that, but then there's still many things that are not thrown away. So that's why be very careful uh, whenever uh, you hear someone say, oh, OK, so I have a new library. It's going to replace everything. You should be very, very cautious, very careful about what you hear. Yeah. We have two more, more minutes. Um, very important. So we're now going more to higher level, uh, since we're going to be wrapping up. And related to the previous point, you will hear a lot about 
uh, a lot of technologies, a lot of libraries coming our way. Every day there's something like AI at Google solve this, AI at Microsoft uh, uh, solve that. So industry is moving really, really fast, uh, just in general, uh, now, especially now. And my model is that you would want to be, you would want to read about those, but be cautiously optimistic, be very careful about hype. And uh, how many of you heard of AI winters? AI winters? Oh, OK. OK, sorry, you're you are the older, oldest one. So all these are the young, young youngsters. So if you haven't heard of it, uh, we are in actually in the third wave of AI. You hear about all these AI fantastic things. Uh, there were two previous AI winter, as in the first wave was, uh, I think, around the nice, uh, early 80s. Uh, the what, what reason they call AI winter is because there's a, 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 a stop of funding. So usually when, when there's technology going well, then the, uh, researchers start to make big promises as well. Uh, we're going to solve all the problems. We're going to have uh, human level intelligence and all those uh, that did not happen. And then another round, uh, late 80s, and people say that again, and then they did not happen either. So we call it AI winter. So stop of funding, uh, the, uh, the hype from the industry kind of uh, went away. So we are actually now in the third wave of AI. So uh, I think this third wave should stay at least for much longer. Uh, some people are saying that is we might see not winter, but we may see some fall. Fall as in, well, some company are overhyped, they may go away, but then there's still a lot of things because of hardware advances, uh, those will stay around. So, but in general, be very careful. If something, sometimes people say AI is going to solve all problems, uh, that's not true. Even uh, some of you might remember from a couple of years back, CEOs of companies including NVIDIA, they make a prediction and say, well, by the year 2019, we're going to have self-driving car on the road everywhere. Well, of course, it does not happen. Even for the self-driving car that you see, for example, in Arizona, like uh, Go Waymo, and it's in a very, in a grid, right? So in a certain area, and the reason they pick Arizona, you may know, because it's always sunshine, there's no snow, the streets are super wide, right? So under some condition, it can work really, really well. Right. So, so be very careful about hype. Uh, don't buy into, oh, we're going to solve all, all, all the problems. Learn about it, of course, but be very careful. When someone's saying, because solve all problems, likely it's wrong. Yes, we work in AI, I think all, the, all of us work in it, we know. Actually, the research progress is fast, but it's still pretty, pretty slow. Even you're talking about AI is really, really great, but it's, it's not even better than a, a, a three-year-old. A three-year-old, no, well, uh, for example, no, if the fire is hot, right? So. What data does a three-year-old need to know? They put a hand a little closer to the fire. Oh, OK, I'm going to take it away. If you want a computer to learn about that, what they have to do currently is, well, I need data. So what do you do? Well, I put my hand to the fire. OK, it burns. OK, that's once. OK, let's do it again. OK, it burns. OK, it burns, burns. You do it 1,000 times. OK, now I know fire burns. So that is an example of that. Currently, machine learning still need to rely on, on a lot of data a lot, a lot of data before they learn something helpful. On the other hand, uh, human beings are still really good. So a lot of things you can do it. Only, you don't even need to do it sometimes. You just need to look at it and, oh, this is bad. Right. So, so be very cool about it. So the very last one, uh, overran, is very important. Uh, I hope in the audience. And how many of you, uh, I think, uh, how do I say? How many of you learn from, uh, uh, have like a non-computing background? Non-computing background? Or every computer background, that's good. How many have taken uh, classes, like uh, we call a like soft skill or a like presentation skill or like learning how to present? Um, anyone? Okay, so, oh, okay, good, that's great, that's great. If you haven't, I would say take, take, uh, uh, take all, the, all the opportunity that you may have. It could be for my course, for example, like have a project presentation, it could be like poster presentation, or even better, if the opportunity at the, at the school, university, uh, that if they offer these, uh, these courses, uh, short courses, I would, I would recommend taking it. Um, so soft skills would mean how do you uh, sell, sell your, your work? So sell, selling here is pretty general. For example, I'm currently selling my work to you. So as in telling this is important. And if you are doing research, you might need to present your work at conferences. Right? You could be giving presentation or at a poster session. Those are what we call selling your work. Selling as in convincing people that what you do is relevant, what's interesting. And of course, in the, in the context of industry, that means how do you convince, let's say you talk to your colleague, you talk to your manager, you have a new idea, you want them to take you seriously and to uh, look into it. So how do you convince that that's important? So that's what we call soft skill. And I also cover other things too, as in uh, networking. So, 
Uh, networking is very important, and uh, often that could uh, give you new career opportunities. Actually, a lot of times career opportunities come through your friends, uh, or maybe you, you uh, learn to what uh, learn to do what you do right now is because a friend say you, hey, that's what you should do. Or you may be taking a particular class because your friend tell you that the class is good. So all these are through uh, connections. So how do you build connections? How, for example, at our conferences, um, how do you approach strangers? How do you uh, make friends with them? So those are soft skills. I would say that uh, soft skills are often even more important than hard skills. Uh, because hard skills you can read from books, right? You can read from books, you can do uh, programming, you can try things out. While for soft skills, you do need to interact. You cannot just say, I'm going to stay home, I'm going to do anything. You do need to reach out, you do need to lock, talk to human beings, you do, do need to uh, look at them in their eyes, and sometimes very uncomfortable, but you can do it. Uh, so, for example, I, growing up, I'm a very shy kid, so doing all these things, I would be very nervous, but then I learned some uh, good skill. For example, with our presentation, um, how do you make it more engaging? Is well, you want to look at the audience. But how do you look at the audience? Well, you want to scan the room, like from left to right. So, uh, in the beginning, I'll, I'll just look at my, my screen. But uh, but there's a good good skill if you've never done it. Is you don't really need to look at the audience. So, for example, I can say I'm looking, I'm I'm moving my eyes around, and you think I'm looking at someone, but I'm actually looking at no one. <laughs> so I'm picking a corner there, putting a corner there, and then my eye just move there. Right, so and then you thought I'm looking at someone, but I'm actually looking at no one. Uh, so that that is one one gentle start. Of course, like, I do look at some of you and now because then I feel a lot more comfortable. So those are just like part of the soft skills. Right? So you want to develop that, and and you want to do it more. And the more that you do, it, the more comfortable and the more easy. So so now now I when I'm uh, giving a lecture or teaching, then I'll be very different from my actually original personality or like a little, little shy kid. So very very important. So I encourage you to take all the opportunities that you have. It takes time, over time, but you can always start. It's never too late. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to stop here. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, uh, do we take questions or anything? Or do you wrap up? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the question is uh, uh, for higher dimensional data, let's say about three dimensions. For two dimensions, you can visualize scatter plot, three dimensions, maybe a 3D scatter plot. So, higher than three dimensions, what do you do? So, there are techniques like uh, dimensional reduction, like reducing high dimensional data to lower dimensional data. But there's a downside, of course, you lose information whenever you compress things or uh, bring it down to lower dimension, you lose it. Uh, that's, that's one way, uh, very common. And then the other way is you use what we call a small multiple. Small multiple, that, uh, that means you show very, uh, a large number of small plots. So let's say you have uh, 20 dimension, not very high, but 20 dimension. So let's say you only want to use scatter plot. So each scatter plot is two, two dimension. So now that you just visualize all the combination of two dimensions out of the 20 dimension. So that's another way. If you look at a small multiple, there are examples like that. And of course, it doesn't, again, doesn't handle 1,000 right, dimensions. So in the end, you do need to use a combination. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah. I don't know uh, if uh, y'all has already introduced uh, Polo in teaching a class. Uh, yeah. Visualization, yeah, exactly. you mentioned. Yes, data visualization, yes. Uh, okay, so I'll probably just say that this is, uh, as I know of, one of the most popular class in computer science, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the visualization. Was it 200 students? Uh, yeah, campus like 50, students. Uh, posters at the end of the semester. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really a big event in the Georgia Tech in computer science. And also, I'm understanding that those materials are online, right? Yes. So, so if you are interested, take a look at his course webpage. Yeah. Um, so, so let's thank him again. Thank you. Or close this thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.